everyone, and welcome back to the Whale Nerds podcast. This is episode 124. My name is Caitlin, and I am flying solo this week, Uh, so a little bit different than our usual episodes, but I figured I would put up uh, some information about humpback competitive behaviors, catch up on sightings, all that good stuff. Um, But before we get started, just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been supporting the podcast, whether whether that's on Patreon or coming on trips or just listening to the podcast or rating or reviewing it somewhere that helps other people see the podcast. So thank you very much for supporting us over the last couple years. And thank you for telling other people to listen to the podcast. It means a lot to us. Um, As far as being able to keep up with what we're seeing and what we're doing, as a, as a group, you can follow along on our website or on social media. The website is thewhalenerds.com. We have a blog. We have our trip schedule. We have a little bit of merch up there. Um, and then online on social media, we're at Whale Nerds on Facebook and Instagram. And we also have a YouTube channel under the Whale Nerds podcast. So if you want to check out video versions of our episodes from episode 100 onward, or if you want to see some of the other videos that we've put out, Uh, you can definitely check it all out on YouTube. So thanks for following along with us. Uh, As far as sightings go, uh, since I last talked with Slater on episode 123, we've had lots of humpback whales. We have had some sightings of uh, dolphins, lots of Rissos dolphins, still some Pacific white-sided and northern right whale dolphins in Monterey Bay. And for humpback whales, as far as behavior goes, uh, we had a storm come through, which kind of move the whales around a lot and it's been interesting to see where they've been going like some nights overnight moving 10 to 15 miles which is pretty incredible that we even find them every day (laughs) because you think you know where they are and then they're totally in a different spot and you can match them up with the tails and be like we definitely saw that whale yesterday like more than 10 miles from here Um, we have seen lots of different feeding groups with sea lions. A couple days ago, it was like thousands of sea lions and like 25 to 30 whales in a two mile radius. It was pretty incredible. Seeing some surface feeding was really good. Uh, for moms and calves lately, we've been seeing angel wing calf. Um, her calf's name is ghost pepper. They cover a lot of area each day. Um, like I think they covered almost 20 miles overnight last night it was pretty crazy um and then ratchet and her calf ricochet have been around blingy and calf have been around and so that's been pretty fun to see them and rat ratchet's calf is like really roughed up like clubs' calf i don't know there's a couple little whales that have like some skin stuff going on i don't know if it's some kind of like infection like maybe it starts as an injury and then they get like this weird skin thing afterwards but they're like really uneven coloration lots of scarring lots of barnacles and then like you see some like chafing like especially on the sides of the body like where their pectoral flipper rubs on their side when they're swimming so pretty weird to see But I don't know. I guess we'll see if they make it, like, what happens with their skin after they heal. Like, Clubs' calf looks way better than it did in May, so I don't don't really know what's up with that. But there are at least three little calves that are pretty roughed up like that. And then Blingy's calf has a lot of white on its lower jaw on both sides and in the very front. And I don't know if it's, like, heavy chafing and scarring from barnacles and, like, maybe getting roughed up by something, but it, like glows underwater like a fin whale's lower jaw it's pretty wild to see and then we've had a surprise visitor on the high spirits and other boats for about 10 days now and so starting on like september 12th a red-footed booby has been like circling boats and landing on them and on the night of the 12th it tried to land on a boat that was out of monterey and then on the morning of the 13th we were whale watching down off point pinos and it landed on the high spirits and it like stayed on the starboard bow railing and we didn't have very many people on the boat so like it was fine we just let it do its thing and we thought it would just land and then fly off like warblers do that in the fall when they're migrating especially if it's foggy they like get lost so they just need to rest 
for a couple minutes. Sometimes we like put water out for them and they'll drink the water and then they, they fly off once they see land. But the birds stayed on the boat, like didn't care if the people were standing around it. Like no one tried to like touch it or anything, but like it just hung out on board and it watched whales with us <laughs> for like over an hour. So we just let it do its thing and we like took lots of pictures of it and it was just like vigorously preening and then we turned and started driving back to Moss Landing and it stayed on the boat and we were like, oh, okay, I mean, that's fine. And so like some of the other boats kind of came by and like looked at the bird because it's a rare bird. It's a tropical bird, probably came from Mexico or Central America, but you know, it's not like we don't see them in our area. And so it's not banded. We don't know exactly where it's from. It could be from somewhere else entirely. Like they range into the Indian Ocean. They see them in the Caribbean. They can see them in South America. So like who knows? They see, I've seen them in Hawaii. Like who knows where this bird came from? But it was really cool that it hung out on the railing. So we just drive back to Moss Landing and it stays on the boat the whole way. It keeps preening. It kind of like hangs out and looks around. It took a nap. Like <laughs> it's just totally comfortable and some of those seabirds like boobies are born on like remote islands so maybe it's just not afraid of people because it's not like it's never had to be but I don't know it was pretty cool so we got back to the harbor and we got inside the jetty and I was like should I turn the PA on like what should I do and then it flew off and like flew over to the north jetty towards the beach and we didn't see it again and we we're like all right well that was cool and so I did a normal trip wrap up and, and it was all good. And I decided we should name it Nelson. And so I don't I don't know. I just felt like it was a good name. And so then we went out the next day and like kind of were like, oh, I wonder if it's gonna still be around, you know, we'll see what happens. And we left the jetty and Kate and I both realized that like we didn't even look for the bird. Like maybe it was roosting on the jetty and we like didn't even look. So we both felt kind of silly. And we got to our first group of whales, which is like a bunch of teenage whales, like maybe three or four miles out of the harbor. And they weren't doing anything terribly exciting. They're kind of feeding in little subgroups around sea lions, but they're taking long dives. So we're like, all right, cool. Well, we're going to keep going. And just as we started to pick up speed, it landed on the boat again it like did a pass off the side of the boat like no one saw it coming it came up the port side flew over the bow and landed on the starboard railing again and I was like oh my gosh so again we didn't have very many people on the boat and so we just let it hang out and <laughs> we took it whale watching it stayed on the boat for almost three hours like, we went down to another group of whales. We watched those whales. Like, four different boats came over and took pictures of our boat because it had the bird on it. Oh, it's hilarious. And, like, it just hung out and preened, cleaned its feathers, like, took a nap a couple times and just watched whales with us. It was just so cool. And then the next day after that, I think the next two days after that, we didn't see it. But other boats saw it. Like, it landed on a couple other boats, and they told us about it. And so then we were like, well, maybe he's just tired of us. Because we thought for a while that our wider wooden handrails are, like, a preferred perch. I mean, they do nest in trees, but uh, maybe that railing's easier to hold on to. And so we thought, like, it just liked our boat better than the other ones because it could stand there for longer periods without having to work so hard. But then it started to land on other boats for two days, and we are like, oh, all right, well, maybe it doesn't like us. And then... Again, on the fifth day, it came flying in at the bow, and Kate and I both were like, that's a weird-looking bird. And then it flew off the port side, circled around, came back in the port side, and landed on the starboard railing. And I was sitting on the front of the boat just screaming like, Nelson, Nelson! And despite me screaming, it still landed on the boat and stayed on the boat for hours. <laughs> so that's been pretty amazing. We did have a big south storm with lots of rain come after that, and we didn't see the bird for two days. And then this afternoon, after we were almost already back in the harbor, some boats said it was trying to land on their boat. So I don't know, maybe tomorrow will be our day. But yeah, it's been pretty interesting to see this red-footed booby just make the rounds on 
all the different boats and then like our boat turned into a bird watching tour because everybody else came by. <laughs> so it's been pretty awesome. Uh, one of the whales that other exotic visitors that we still had, we had two whales, I think in the last sighting report I did with Slater that were sighted in Alaska. And one of those whales is still around, which is pretty amazing. It's just in the mix with other feeding whales. It's getting in the mix of sea lions. So it's like starting to figure out the Monterey routine. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it'll become a regular summer visitor. It's been here for like three weeks now. So pretty cool. Um, we did have killer whales yesterday. It's been fairly slow for sightings of them. But uh, we did have the... 140 B's and the 39 A's or something. I don't know. It was Luis's family and like three other whales. So eight killer whales total, all female looking types. Maybe one of them was a sprouting male. And uh, we were on an all day trip on the high spirits. So we took a big pass offshore. And then as we were coming kind of down towards um, the south part of the canyon and stuff, we were looking inshore and there was some splashing and we kind of kept watching it and it turned out to be killer whales. It was a little hard to keep track of them because it was all female types and they were a little bit spread out, but they kept splashing every once in a while. So when we got caught up there, there was one group that was splashing and they were like kicking auklets into the air, which I've seen them harass birds before, but like this was a little extra. And then there was another like patch of gulls that were like all excited just to the north of them and we're like, what's that about? Like, is there something else there? And we kept seeing splashing and couldn't tell what it was. So there were kind of in two subgroups. It was like the three whales that were in their own group and then Luis's family and Luis's family was eating something. And then the other three whales were just harassing these auklets like to death. Like it was pretty bad. They were like kicking them in the air, grabbing them with their mouth. And like, when I'm saying kicking it, like they like punted it in the air like you saw a little thing flying through the air for like 30 40 feet and then they'd mess with it a little bit while it was dead play around with it and then leave it like a little dolly they just like dropped it on the ground and kept going and they did that to like four different ones and at one point they brought one to the group that was eating and they were eating a sea lion and they like came over to the boat with the sea lion carcass and you could see very clearly that it was brown hair it looked like the side of a sea lion they had the skin on their head, like, they were just, like, all, yeah, it was just a lot, and they came by the boat a few times, which was pretty cool, they dragged the, paraded the carcass around, paraded around their dead bird, and at one point, they went to the back of the boat, and they were passing the dead bird back and forth with their mouth, so, like, one whale was holding it, like, at the tip of its snout, and you could see its teeth, and the bird, and then it opened its mouth and, like, put the bird in the corner of its mouth while it was, like, spy hopping. Dropped the bird to the whale underneath it. The whale underneath it, like, played with it, balanced it on its chin, and then grabbed it a little bit. And then the little calf came over and grabbed it from that whale. So, like, three different whales passed the bird off right next to the boat. I have video of it. I'll have to figure out if I should put it on our YouTube channel or what with some photos and an explanation. But it's pretty amazing to see him like sharing it around. And you could see him sharing the carcass too because they were passing it around like swimming under the boat with it and stuff, which was pretty incredible. Um, very mean. I mean, at one point I think I just said, you guys, killer whales are so mean <laughs> to everybody on deck, which no one really cared. But, you know. It's just incredible to see them do stuff like that, be so delicate. Like, the bird didn't come apart at all. They just, like, gently pass it to one another, even though they were using their mouth. And they had just beaten it to death. But, you know, I guess it's the, like, yin and yang of killer whales or something. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty interesting. Then they started traveling. They went offshore. And um, we, I'm, I'm assuming they left the bay because we didn't see them again today. And off and on over the past maybe week, we've had some competition behaviors of humpback whales. We've been hearing other boats say they'd seen some competitive behavior from humpbacks. And we saw like a really good sized group. It was probably like six or seven whales uh, one day and they swam towards a feeding group. And then a group of Risso's dolphins came and got in the mix, which was pretty cool. It was kind of like bottlenose dolphins and 
um, Hawaii where I've seen them kind of get in and like watch and harass and add to the whole chaos of a competition group. And then a few days after that, uh, Blingy and Calf were like the focus animals of a competition group and it was two males chasing them around. They gave us a couple really nice close passes under the boat. I don't know if Blingy was trying to like ditch them by using the boat as a screen or what, but it was pretty amazing to get good looks at that calf. Its whole tail has been like heavily chewed by killer whales and so it's like missing the corners. It has some big rake marks and then it has that weird looking coloration on the lower jaw. So it was really good to see that whale uh, up close and personal which was really interesting so that kind of like leads me into my segue of like what are we looking at with competitive groups I don't think I like I've talked about them on the podcast but I don't think I've ever actually explained like what is it and like when you see it like how do you know it's a competitive group and I know that this year the competition groups have started really early like some reports by the end of August this year in Monterey, so maybe this is happening on other feeding grounds um, in the Northern Hemisphere, and maybe naturalists have never seen it before and are a little confused by, like, what's going on or, like, not really sure how to describe what they're seeing. And also, I just generally think since we're getting ready for the end of feeding season, starting Northern Hemisphere breeding season, it'd be good to kind of just talk about it now. Um, that way people have more context going into the winter if they're watching humpback whales in, like, Mexico or Maui or the Caribbean, something like that. So, uh, the basics of a competitive group, we, what you're looking at typically is the lead animal is the female and you'll hear people call that the nuclear animal or the focus animal. And so she's kind of like leading the group. And then we generally assume that all the whales behind her are male, but there is some evidence from a 2015 paper from Ecuador based on some genetic testing they were able to get from skin samples of surface active whales in competition groups that there may be more than one female present. It wasn't real clear if it was like multiple competition groups merged and like the females didn't leave or like what the beginning of that was. I didn't dive too deep in like their data collection information if it was attached in the appendix to see, but they had multiple groups where they were able to genetically verify more than one female was present. So it could be a female. I guess it kind of depends on context. If you're, if you watch two groups merge, then you could kind of assume that maybe both females stay in there unless you can verify one of them leaves. And it's interesting. They kind of like get momentum sometimes. And all of a sudden it's like, they just like the big group is like gravity and it like pulls up the other groups in. So the first whale swimming behind the female is the lead male uh, and he that's called the primary escort or the primary male and he's kind of like in the first swimming position behind the female and all the other whales following behind the primary escort are called secondary es escorts or challengers and one of the very scientific terms you can use if a whale gives up on a competition group and leaves you can call that whale a loser I promise that's actually like what they use in the papers. <laughs> it's kind of mean, but you know, it's a scientific term, loser. Uh, kind of the general assumed point of a competition group is that it's a test of fitness. And I do mean the definition of fitness in the scientific sense where they are genetically and physically superior to be the mate of the female. And it's a show of endurance to the female. And the goal of the males is to win the primary escort position, the first swimming position behind the female. But it's not to kill their opponents. It's just to exhaust them into giving up. So they're all down there fasting. They're all burning a lot of energy in these competition groups. And they're all down there to try and pass their genetic material to the next generation. So... They don't necessarily want to kill their opponents because if they're not the primary escort, they don't want to be killed either because then they don't get an opportunity to try and mate again later in the season. They're just trying to get them to be tired enough to give up. And it kind of looks like a race and a wrestling match. And sometimes I think people think it's really slow, but just to give some context of like what's happening. So you're watching animals that weigh 
30 to 40 tons and they're moving through water. So like fresh water is almost 800 times more dense than air and this is salt water. So it's even more dense. So like it, when you see them going like five or six knots and they're pushing each other and splashing and like zigzagging, like that's really fast. That's a lot of energy going on. Like if you've ever been to the beach or the river and you like are running on the sand and then you run in the water and it's just like, you feel like you're running through mud. It's because it's, it, it's that much thicker of a medium. And so having these animals that are totally designed to be in the water, getting that much speed while battling each other is pretty incredible. It's a really amazing show of force. And one of the things I tell people sometimes is like, look at the pressure wave of water coming off the front of the whales when they're moving or like, look at how big their fluke prints get when they do go down because that kind of helps you understand how much they're moving through that water and all it really takes uh to have a competition group is two males and a female like it just takes three total whales it needs to be one whale challenging an escort and then you're off to the races with a competition group um, some common tactics that you will see males use in competition are uh, bubble blasting especially where they're like swimming and making a stream of bubbles out of their blowhole while they're just subsurface and so it's like a big line of bubbles following the direction of the whale and you'll see a lot of splashing kind of like flicking their tails or like picking their heads up to make white water and that basically creates a visual screen underwater so if you've been to a pool and you've had someone kick in front of you all those bubbles make a bunch of white water in front of your face and you're basically blind under there. So they're trying to do that so that they are blocking the view of the female from their competitors and maybe that will give them just enough of, a, of an edge to get ahead of another whale that's next to them and they could slide into that primary escort position uh, by making that visual screen. At the surface, you'll also see them do um, like funny behaviors and postures with their head. They'll like pick their head up or they'll slam their head down like do a big head lunge or they'll like swim in like almost this like motorboat or like alligator alligator position where like their rostrum like their tubercles are very easy to see and they're just like swimming with their head up and you can tell like their chest is down and it like it just looks really funny and sometimes you'll see them when they pick their head up they clap their jaw they like open and close their mouth a little bit sometimes you can hear it and a lot of times it just looks like they did a little like chomp, but didn't like open their mouth enough to see the baleen. That's called a jaw clap. And then sometimes they do inflate their uh, throat pleats and you can see that even at the surface if they pick their head up enough, like they expand their pleats out like a bullfrog. And all of those posturing things are a way to show aggression towards their competitors, but also it kind of makes them look bigger. And so it's kind of just a like a posturing and aggression thing to the other males in the group. Um, and then you will see them hit each other. There's a lot of physical ramming, kicking, bashing. Uh, they use that hardened structure on their lower jaw called a jaw plate. They slam it down on the back of another whale. And um, this will physically move whales out of position so that the, the secondary or the challenger can get into that primary escort position. And like in when it's in clear water and you're in the breeding grounds, like sometimes if it's close to the boat, you can actually see them down 20 or 30 feet, make contact with one another. Like they will butt heads really hard and like you'll see the other whale get physically pushed away and that's trying to wear down their opponent and, and make an edge on their position. And then it's pretty high speed. Sometimes it's just a lot of chasing, a lot of flicking of tails and like moving fast at the surface, just trying to really, you know, test the endurance and outpace their opponent. You will hear a lot of trumpet blows. That's another fairly common thing. What's not as common, so like if you're not seeing these things, it's not unusual. A lot of times they like are not very good about fluke up diving. So then you're like trying to get the IDs and you're like, wow, cool. Like none of you are showing your tails, which is not fun. And then sometimes a whale on the periphery will breach, but like 
it's not, it, and it's not unusual to see one of them breach, but it's not very common that they breach. And then you don't usually see spy hopping. If you're seeing their head come up out of the water, it's probably because another whale's underneath them pushing them out of the water. Um, but they don't really like stop and socialize too much or get friendly. They're like very mission oriented when this thing is going on. And um, other observations that you might make from the deck, you'll hear the whales breathing really hard. Like when you start to think about how frequently each whale's coming up, the force of the exhale and you can hear their inhale, you're like, wow, these things are working hard. You can really hear them breathing really hard. Uh, the males, since they're making so much contact with each other, they do mark each other up pretty bad. And so you will see blood on their tubercles because their skin got chafed off or even on their dorsal hump and their dorsal fin. And that's kind of how people get the assumption that the like really roughed up, scarred up old males have those like polka dot marks on their head. And they have like that mohawk mark on their dorsal fin, sometimes even down their tail stalk and on the top of their fluke, it's all chafed and white scarred. And it's because of these competition groups. That's like they're losing skin during those battles and sometimes it heals over white. Um, sometimes these groups actually do take pretty long dives, like six or seven minutes, which then you think, well, is it over? Or like, is it not a competition group? Because especially in the feeding grounds, you're like, well, did they stop for a snack? Like what's going on? But it's not unusual for them to take really long dives during this, even though they're working really hard. They do change direction a lot, so sometimes if, especially if you're like a new captain that's never seen competition before, they're hard to keep track of. Like they do pull a fast one and turn around completely during their surfacing. So you have to really kind of take note of the dorsal fins and like keep track of how many are in your group to know that you're still following a competition group. Um, the female whales sometimes seem to use the boat as a tool during the encounter. They'll like directly take the whole group underneath the boat. And I don't know if it's like she's trying to ditch the males. She's trying to help the primary escort in losing some competitors. If she's like over it and wants to be done with them all and, you know, tries to create her own screen or blockade. I don't know. Because um, other times it seems like the female's like, egging them on like trying to get them to keep fighting and you'll see her peck slap at the front of the group she'll just swim on her side and peck slap for the whole surfacing before she takes a dive and they all dive after her if you do see the nuclear animal is a mom with a calf the calf often becomes quite distressed um, so on the feeding grounds and the breeding grounds I've seen it happen I think it's more stressful when they're a newborn because they're already like not great at swimming and they are trying to grow and you know this is a very high speed encounter and there's a lot like I've seen males like hit the calves before and so it's a pretty tough thing for a young whale to be a part of but up in the feeding grounds you'll see it too but then the calves are way more fit and like a much better swimmer so uh, but you will hear the calf trumpet. You might see the calf tail slap a lot. Um, sometimes when they're really little, the mom will put the calf on her back, kind of like they do when they're trying to avoid uh, killer whales. And yeah, I mean, I've seen the males like push the calf in the air like killer whales do too, like batten it up out of the water, which is pretty gnarly. Um, other things that you'll see are the group sizes change a lot. So whales will drop off because they have given up and new whales will come in to challenge the group because it is a test of endurance. So sometimes whales know like, oh, these guys have been going at it for a while, but come in and try and knock the primary escort off his pedestal. And sometimes it's an interaction that can go on for hours. Like it's been documented from sunset to sunrise the next day. It's been documented over the course of an entire day. And so it is a really long duration type event sometimes. And then it's also not unusual for dolphins to join. And I don't know what the role of the dolphins is, but they I've seen bottlenose dolphins get in there. Now I've seen Risso's dolphins get in there. And I don't know, like I just joke with the passengers. I'm like, maybe they're the referee. Maybe they're bored and they want something to do. Maybe they want to be involved. I, I really don't understand what the role is, but I definitely last season in Maui saw a lot of bottlenose dolphins in with competitive groups and 
So just there's a few papers that I'll link on the Facebook comment thread when we post about this episode. Um, but there is a few like older original papers from 1983 and 1984 that like first officially described this set of behaviors I've been talking about. And then the 2015 paper from Ecuador I'll put in there. And then this paper, which is called When Whales Collide, Critter Cams Offer Insight into Competitive Behavior of Humpback Whales on Their Hawaiian Wintering Grounds. And I think this was actually more of like a write-up for Nat Geo as like a follow-up from the Critter Cam program. This They were like all the rage in the early 2000s. And so it's it's a open source PDF and it just talks about things that they've seen and screenshots and all that kind of stuff. So the study period was 2005 and 2006 in the Hawaiian Islands and they were able to deploy 10 of these critter cam tags. I mean, this was like early days of like putting suction cup tags on whales. Um, they had front and rear facing cameras and they had some other measuring equipment attached as well. Um, so some of the interesting highlights that they were able to see because of the critter cams were things like how deep did the whales dive, what were they doing down there, and they actually got a little more evidence about um, what the female was doing during the interactions. So they had whales diving depths of 10 meters down to 298 meters during competitive group behavior. So that's like 30 feet to 890 feet deep during competitive groups. Um, several times the whales actually all swam along the seafloor, which is pretty interesting that they all went down there. Uh, they did get some footage of one whale opening its mouth and inflating its throat pleats underwater. So that same posturing behavior that's seen at the surface is also happening below. Um, one whale also swam to the bottom several times and the final time that it swam down there, it like sculled its flippers. So it kind of like waved its flippers back and forth and welled up the sand and sent up a big sand plume. And then right afterwards knocked the tag off its body. So they don't know what happened after that. And then they had three interesting observations of the females throughout competitive groups that they were able to record. In one instance, the female was like kind of moving her flippers back and forth really close to the primary escort. I don't know if that was like some, they don't know if it was like some kind of encouraging behavior, like reassuring that he should be the primary or like what was going on there, but it was pretty interesting to see. And then there was another instance where the male and female were like kind of head to head with each other, but the female female was like kind of above the male and her throat was facing down towards his blowhole and he blew bubbles underneath her and like the bubbles were like touching her and then there was another instance where the female like they looked at their tail beat measurement and the, they could tell the female was like drafting off the male like she was like surfing his pressure wave as he was swimming behind her so maybe some of those behaviors exhibit like female choice or like her show of preference for mates in the interaction like maybe some sort of encouragement or like her sort of sorting the group but yeah pretty interesting stuff and I think you know as technology gets better we observe these groups with drones we start to get genetic analysis from different groups of whales and more breeding grounds have more people out there studying this stuff it'll be interesting to see like if anything really novel comes out of it or if we really understand like who initiates it, you know, like do fem females sometimes change their mind? They're over it and that's why they swim under the boat, like that kind of stuff that we still don't really understand. Or, you know, the other thing we d still don't know is if the primary escort when he's like, quote unquote, the winner and like everybody else gives up, does he get to mate with the female? Like, we don't know. Like, there's maybe been a few observations in the last year of humpback whales actually mating that's not public yet, but I don't know the context of, like, did that whale win a comp group? Was it a diving pair? Like, we don't know what led up to that interaction. So, pretty interesting stuff, but hopefully that kind of sheds some light on what you're seeing when you're watching a competitive group. If you think you might be watching a competitive group, hopefully that's helpful information and hopefully that better highlights like what I'm describing when I'm saying I'm seeing a comp 
a comp group or a competition group. And kind of like describing all these behaviors, I really do also think that the term heat run is like totally appropriate for these groups. When after you've watched them a bit, like I hear that term used more with blue whales, but like I think a heat run is a good way to describe it. So uh, thanks for listening. And I think our secret whale of the week can be Nelson, the which is not a whale at all, but it's totally fine. And uh, thanks for following along with us online and for sharing the podcast and for sticking around. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Bye.